All right, let's talk about the truth behind oatmeal, eggs, bacon, and coffee. But before we do that, the real question is, should you even eat breakfast or what should you do before you eat breakfast? Let's talk about that for a second. Where's uh, Where are you guys at with your current uh, habits around breakfast? I know that through the 10 years we've been doing this, I know I've, everybody's been a different- It's changed. Yeah, yeah uh, different, different I've place. tried them all. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, we all have. Yeah. But I mean, like, where is everybody currently at right now? Like, you, I think, I feel like I you're train, on breakfast too by the time we see each other. I, well, I eat breakfast uh, after I work out. So I work out um, in the morning. So I wake up at five. Oh, so is that your first breakfast when I see you eating? That's it. Oh, yeah, I yeah. thought that's your second one. No, that's my first meal. Oh, okay. So I'll eat breakfast at 9 a.m., but I typically work out at seven. So 7 a.m., and then I come over here and then I'll eat breakfast oh, okay. uh, because I work out so early. It, it doesn't make sense to eat. Super early in the morning for me. It doesn't feel it's the second great. breakfasts. No, <laughs> no. What yeah. about you? Where are you? Where are you at? I do like um, it's either scrambled eggs, bacon, or sausage, or like a uh, protein shake in the morning. Like I've been trying to be as consistent as possible for breakfast, just because it's the opposite of what I was doing <clears throat> years back. Like I probably for about like two or three years, I was like not eating breakfast at all, and I was definitely feeling the impact of that. Uh, and I feel this shift like <clears throat> energy wise, but also I think, um, ah, it, it's, it's hard to say, but it, like when I was not eating breakfast in the morning and it just, I, I feel like my metabolism and everything definitely slowed down. Mm. So this is, this has been a boost for me. I always, I always have a hard time, uh, building muscle if I'm not making a conscious effort to attack breakfast. I think it's always been good for me for mitigating weight gain or uh, keeping my weight down. It's never been good for me when it comes to building muscle. It's yeah. always difficult to- Just because you're hard, it's hard to get enough calories. Yeah, calories and protein. Like yeah. it just without having, and so when you guys see me eat, that's my first meal. Uh, I'm not eating at home. I'm not eating until I get here. And that's the, the four scrambled eggs, four pieces of bacon, and then the sourdough toast dry which is my pretty much my staple breakfast right now. So I think so. I think what's interesting around this conversation is there's a few things now that are um, popular. It's either when we were growing up, it was breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Everybody has to eat breakfast. Yeah. Um, now it's pretty clear that that message was promoted by the uh, a large segment. Cereal of, companies. Yeah, the food industry. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when you would, uh, we would see commercials all the time and you could probably find these now, um, it would say, you know, it's part of a complete breakfast at the end of every cereal commercial. Yeah, yeah. Then they'd show a picture of what- Fortified the vitamins. Yeah, yeah what, what the complete breakfast looked like. And Some it was cartoon a- cartoon toucan. It was a bowl of cereal. It was non-fat milk. It was a glass of orange juice and toast. That's what every picture at the end of those commercials were. Um, and then the message became skip breakfast or fast, fast for a long period of time. And so I think people are more confused than ever. Do I eat it? Do I not eat it? What do I eat? Like, yeah. is this beneficial? Now, as coaches and trainers, and I, I'm, I know you guys discovered the same thing, at the end of the day, uh, and we could talk about what the best foods typically are for breakfast, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, whether or not you should eat breakfast really depends on if it feels good or not. I mean, it really doesn't make a difference if you eat in the morning or not. Uh, what makes a difference is the context of you and your life. So like Adam, you, you, know, you said, for you, it's hard to hit your protein targets if you skip breakfast. If you wait till noon, well, now you got to get 200 grams of protein from noon till bed versus yeah. when you ate a, a 50 gram or 60 gram, you know, of protein breakfast. Um, I don't eat first thing in the morning because I work out best fasted. I had many clients who worked out best fed. I had many clients who worked out best fasted. The really, it really doesn't make a big difference until you look at the individual and you determine what works best uh, for them. How do you feel if you work out fasted or how do you feel when you skip breakfast or eat breakfast? The one thing I want to challenge with the statement, uh, you know, what works best for you is I think a lot of clients um, don't understand that, right? They, they don't know what works best. Yeah, they interpret that as I feel good when I don't eat, you know, or it's easier for me to skip breakfast right. and I'm not hungry until noon. Therefore, it's what's best for me. Um, and they're missing the part of how crucial it is to hit the protein intake it, during our fitness journey, even for somebody, and even more importantly for somebody who's trying to lose body fat. For some reason, because of how popular fasting has come back on strong in the last 10 years, 
uh, there's been this movement of fasting again and not eating breakfast and skipping it. And then people saying they feel better that way because it's easier, it's more convenient, and, oh, I don't feel lethargic. Problem is they're getting till noon, one or two, and they're eating their first meal, and they're not getting anywhere near their protein targets. Yeah, so so let's touch on the whole feel better part. Now, there are cases where you'll see functional medicine practitioners will either advise people to or not eat breakfast, so either eat it or skip it. That's based off things like gut health yep. and hormone levels. But if, if, you, if you extend the fast past... So you go to bed, obviously when you're asleep, you don't eat, you wake up and then you extend that and you throw caffeine. Typically people have their black coffee. What you're doing is you're extending that cortisol spike that you get in the morning. So cortisol typically goes up in the morning and it slowly tapers off throughout the day. Well, when you have insulin going up, when you're digesting food, that'll make cortisol tend to come down. So when people first start fasting in the morning and they're like, my God, I have so much more energy. What they're feeling is the cortisol. Having that extension of cortisol, yeah. especially with caffeine, cortisol is a, 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 an energy producing hormone. So a lot of people, you know, we think cortisol is good, bad. The context matters. But one thing that cortisol do does is it gives you energy. When cortisol is high, you feel kind of wired, which is why you get those cortisol junkies, right? Those people that, that keep pushing the cortisol with caffeine and stressful uh, type environments. So that's kind of what's happening. But if we look generally and look at the data on a general, forget the individual, but just look generally speaking, Starting the day off with a high protein meal tends to cause better balance in insulin throughout the day. It also tends to improve satiety throughout the day. So it also tends to uh, give the client a better chance at hitting their protein. Of course, mm -hmm. that's just objective truth. Yeah, yeah. those are uh, and those are major factors and also major points that I always had to make to the client who wanted to skip breakfast. It's, this was. This, I, I'm glad we're talking about this. I feel like we haven't gone really deep on this conversation in, in a long time, and it's one of the one of the hardest things I remember was having clients that I'm just not hungry in the morning. I just don't want to eat. And in and, and when they're hiring you to lose thirty or fifty pounds, they can't understand you going. Yeah. I need you to eat more in the morning, and you're. They're like, Nah, I'm fat. I need to lose weight. I'm not trying to eat anymore. I already feel better not eating the breakfast. Totally. Let's figure it out from noon on. And it's like, you have no idea how much you're shooting me in the foot when I'm training you three days a week, strength training, sending a signal to build muscle, and you are not giving it adequate protein and the building blocks in order to build that muscle, to build that metabolism, to make the fat loss easier. You're not giving me that. And so all we're really doing when we're lifting weights is burning calories. Mm. And then at that point, it's not that much more effective than you just getting on a treadmill or walking and stuff all day long. Well, let's 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 make it very simple. If you're a woman and your goal is to weigh a hundred and let's say 120 pounds, so your target in protein would be 120 grams. That would be the high protein target that that the studies show um, will help burn more body fat, build more muscle, improve athletic performance, help with satiety. So, okay, I'm hitting 120 grams of protein. But I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's 40 grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, yes. now you skip breakfast. Yeah. Now you got to eat 80, 60 yeah, yeah, grams yeah. of protein yeah. twice, yeah. You or up. you got to eat three meals from noon to, to dinner. So now you're eating all those grams of protein in a condensed time. Yeah. It's hard enough eating it uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for most people, let alone now I'm starting at noon. And how am I going to get 120 and let, grams and, of protein? And let's not layer on the, the fact that you probably working, probably have children, and right. all these other factors right. that make that extremely difficult to do that. And so even though fasting has become so popular in the last decade, I'm normally not a fan of someone doing that. Unless we they've been advised by their functional practitioner or I'm trying to address gut issues first before we tackle the next mountain, which or, is getting the protein intake. Or most importantly, in my opinion, fasting not for physical, athletic performance, aesthetic benefits, but rather detachment and maybe sure. loosely mm -hmm. spiritual benefits. That's the real reason why fasting ever existed as a quote unquote diet anyway. It's actually one of the original diets. Like if you look at um, you know, the, the ancient Greeks and Romans and you look at uh, all the major world religions, fasting's in there. It was never a way to lose weight. It was never for aesthetics. This, none of the reasons why they did fasting. 
they did it to bring uh, spiritual clarity. It's just that it's to a abstain. form. Of, it's a form of detachment. Yes. So if I have a client that is like, man, I got this really bad relationship with food. Um, I want to reset my my hunger cues. Um, I am, you know, I'm somebody that overfeeds myself because I feel like I'm gonna lose muscle. Whatever. Um, I think I'd like to do a just a fast, just yeah. to kind of like break free from food. Stick with my feelings, not feed my feelings, not, you know, eat because I'm stressed, actually sit with them, then yeah, let's do it. But I, but if I have someone's like, I'm going to fast, I want to lose weight. No, not a good idea. I think it's, yeah, it's a good, uh, I think it's good for people to have a bird's eye view of like their behaviors. And, and I think fasting allows you to peer into, you know, some of those tendencies that you have throughout the day. So there's like, there's value in it, but uh, it's definitely been over promoted as this way to, yeah. if you just way cut over this out, you know, yeah, like it's, now you're cutting out these calories and then the rest of your day, you're not going to eat as much and therefore you're going to lose weight. And it just became this whole uh, diet plan that I think um, if you remove the diet plan, you just, and then you just replace it with like a lot of the, the actual um, time you spend observing like your, your behaviors and how you can kind of, you know, adjust and modify and do things a little bit differently, not be dependent on certain types of foods and, you know, avoid the cravings, like set yourself up for better success. Uh, you know, that'd be a much more beneficial way to do it's it. It's not even just way over promoted. It's also being adopted by all the wrong people. Yeah. And the people that I used to, uh, do or recommend it to would be, most people would not think that. Yep. The client that I used to actually recommend fasting to was the bodybuilder. Yes. Yep. Was the bikini athlete, was the orthorexic clients, that ones that weighed and measured and ate six to eight they meals every out. day. And if they yeah. didn't eat every two and hours. They didn't they miss out. their yep. macros. 100%. And they were they were obsessed with making sure they hit that. And they had great bodies, great physiques, great yep. shape, but they had this attachment to weighing and measuring and food and fear around if they didn't that person was who I wanted to detach from food. That was the client, which is not who is promoted to. It's promoted to people that need to lose weight, which is not the client that mm -hmm. for the reasons that we started this podcast was the client that I tried to get to lose 30, 50, hundred pounds, almost always was over consuming on garbage, not moving and exercising and strength training and not hitting their protein intake. Yep. And so the last thing I want to tell that client is to just skip a meal or a couple meals and fast through the day in order to lose it. Because even if that initial cutting out breakfast and late morning eating or whatever that whatever period of time we're fasting for, for that client who's 100 pounds overweight, even if that initially drops them five or 10 pounds, it's not a win. It's not, we're not moving in the right direction. All I did was cut out their donut and coffee and their cheese crackers that they were eating at 11 or and whatever. I'm still missing protein. I'm still not getting yep. good, good, healthy fats. I'm still not feeding the body what it needs in order to build muscle, to build the metabolism. And I, I, I gave them a little bit of a five, 10 pound loss and say a month of cutting out that meal, those meals. And now we're in a worse spot. Now they have an even slower metabolism and they're missing their targets even bigger. Bigger, yeah, you know? you know what's interesting about this? It's so predictable, by the way. So those of us who work professionally in the health and fitness space, when you do it for 10, 15, you know, in my case, 20, 25 years, you start to see trends. Fasting, I could have, I should have predicted fasting because when we first became trainers, okay, fasting was a bad word in the fitness space. If a person came up to you and said, oh, I skip these meals. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to yeah. eat. You got to feed yourself all the time. Yeah. What are you talking about? If somebody said they fasted, stoke that fire. yeah, we would laugh at like fasting. Like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Fasting was like, like it was like a crunchy woo woo thing, and nobody in health and fitness ever took it seriously. And I could have predicted it because what tends to happen with the health and fitness space is people who are smart with marketing will take the opposite approach and then uh, position it and sell it as a way to improve the way you look. And if it's simple and black and white enough, it takes it takes hold. And yeah. black, fasting is about as black and white as it gets. There's one step with my new diet. <laughs> yeah, don't eat. <laughs> don't eat. You know, yeah. and it's like super lose. easy to follow. Wait, you mean I'll lose weight if I don't eat? It's Somehow like, they snuck in amino acids. They sneak in yeah, like all yeah. these other little powders. No, 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 um, no. There, fasting is beautiful uh, and wonderful as a spiritual practice, and I'm using that term loosely, but as a way to improve your health and fitness. Again, outside of the context of maybe someone who's functional medicine practitioner, identify some some benefit uh, for that individual. Uh, no, it's not a great diet. And so for most people, breakfast is probably a good idea. 
And starting with a high protein breakfast, mm -hmm. um, what you want to do when you look at your breakfast is look at your protein targets, um, try to divide it up so that breakfast makes a nice dent in it. And again, the data shows this will help with <laughs> insulin levels throughout the day. It helps with satiety. Eat the protein first. And if you still want to eat more, then go ahead and eat more. So those traditional breakfast foods, uh, toast and fruit, cereal or whatever, if you want to have that, do it after you eat your 30 or 40 grams of protein, which you probably won't. You'll probably be full at that point. It's good. funny because like, I mean, that's really what promoted why I just stopped kind of cutting out breakfast was, and it was because all the heavy carb amount that I was like in incorporating in the meals. And like, so, you know, between like cereal or, uh, you know, anything else like pancakes, waffles, all these things that are normally promoted <laughs> for breakfast. Uh, and then maybe like have some eggs and bacon or something in conjunction with that but you would get this like crazy bonk uh you know around lunchtime and so it's like now i'm gonna fall asleep you know at lunchtime and so you know back then i was like oh i think i just cut you know breakfast out i'm gonna be good and really it's just like if i start out with more protein and totally. just stayed there uh you know that energy carries on throughout the, the day the the go-to hack that for myself and all my clients for the longest time is just i think that Rice, eggs, and cheese, okay, goes with every meat. I just think it does yeah. really well. Like ground beef, turkey, I mean, Blank steak, steak, yeah. steak. I mean, you name it. All, those things go so good with that. And I just, I bulk rice. And the it's, Eggs cook so quick and fast and easy. So I crack a couple eggs over that and throw it in an iron skillet with whatever leftover meat from last night. And all I need is about four ounces of that meat with a couple eggs. And now I've got you myself got a 40 plus gram or 50 plus gram a burrito bowl that I have for it, throw some salsa, cheese, whatever. If you can't have cheese, just have the salsa on it. And it tastes amazing. It's quick, it's easy, and it's high protein, and it starts your day off right. I mean, that's the go-to move. Dude, you know, it's funny. You, you brought up pancakes, and we've said this before, but just to show the power of how powerful marketing and narrative is, mm -hmm. they literally took cake. I know. It's just, like, it's cake. The it, name, it, 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 it's cake. I know. Ingredients it, it, are cake ingredients. It's the same batter that you would make an actual cake. The it's only just, difference is it doesn't have frosting, so instead <laughs> we put flattened it out. syrup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it says syrup. Instead of frosting, it put syrup. And it was sold as a breakfast food. Yeah. You are giving yourself cake. Like, if well, somebody like came a up. cup cake hey, is this cup size cake. Hey, cake. talk about the brilliance, though. Okay. If your market is children that you're trying to get to be, and like every parent in the world was like, this is easy. My kid consistently yeah. eats yeah, this. Yeah. Now <laughs> yeah. they're eating. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> and it's cheap. It. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's flour. Yeah. Try giving them birthday cake for breakfast. Yeah. Every day. What do you they'll, think's going to happen? Definitely eat it every day. Dude. I promise. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. You know, you brought up some combinations of foods. Uh, one thing I'd like to add, if you wanted to add anything to a high protein meal, especially meat, and I've been looking a lot into this lately, are uh, greens, well-cooked greens. So well-cooked greens or greens in general, almost no calories in them, they aid, and the data on this is, is, is quite clear, but I don't think I need to sell this. I think people know this when they do it. They aid in digestion, especially high-protein digestion. So sometimes people will say, oh, my God, when I eat 40 grams of protein, sometimes I, it, it's hard for me to, to, to move that through my body. Yeah, constipation might become an issue. You throw in a nice serving of well-cooked greens, uh, that tends to help. But there are things like there's compounds, cofactors, phytochemicals, in greens, like sulforaphane, for example, um, is, is one example of them, that have been shown uh, in, in, in studies to have these anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory type effects in the body. And when you look at the compounds in meat, uh, you'll see some, some people who will say negative things about meat, like it's pro-inflammatory, <clears throat> it, it stimulates mTOR, et cetera, et cetera. Now, context matters a lot here. Um, but for some people... Balancing meat out with greens creates a perfectly balanced meal. Yeah. Now you have some inflammation, which is not bad, by the way. I want to be yeah. clear. Like and then it moves. <laughs> pro, uh, yeah. like meat is very pro muscle, pro and it's anabolic. Throw a bucket of spinach on that on that iron skillet. You throw. <laughs> That's easy. Yeah. You have greens with your protein, and now you've got these anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory effects, pro-digestion effects. It's literally the perfect. 
it's the perfect pairing yeah. with uh, with meat. It's the perfect pairing with a high protein meal. I think this is why bodybuilders for so long now they do it in a weird way, right? They'll eat the same damn <laughs> vegetable five times a day. I, you know, this is what was so. I was so. Experience. I was so like the the one thing about vegetables because they're not as good. Re, you can't cook in bulk, and so when I was bodybuilding, this is where like Organifi's green juice was like clutch because I could do all the prepping of the. The rice, the meat, all so that that to me is reheated yeah. well. Spinach or asparagus or something cooked from days before and then re microwaved yeah. is disgusting. Yeah. It's uh. soggy. It's gross. And so I, w I mean, always I'm trying. If I'm ma making a meal fresh, I'm always trying to put fresh vegetables. Real food in. first. Yeah, right. real food is always number one. But bro, I lived off of Organifi green juice with this. Like, yeah, that was just like a oh, staple yeah. with a meal like that. So quick, so easy, getting everything I need to get. So if if I eat uh, uh, like a high protein meal, which I digest pretty well anyway, but if it's big, like sometimes I'll have like seventy grams of protein. I'll have a big ass steak or something mm -hmm. like that. I know. All right, I'm gonna have like a, a nice serving of well cooked greens with it. And if I don't, I do the same thing. I'll yeah. drink the Organifi. Yeah. And I just notice a difference in my digestion and how I feel. And it's all those cofactors. There's not a lot of calories in greens, very little, some fiber, you know, nutrient wise, folate, you know, you got folate in there, you got, but it's not like a, I know they say it's nutrient dense, but really if you look at essential nutrients, not really, but the cofactors and phytochemicals that you find in plants are quite unique. Well, and they you do have those benefits. Have you heard, I mean, there's always like some like, I don't know, uh, exotic type supplement that um, it's, so the, the latest one's like sea moss. I don't know if you heard of no. it. Like sea moss. And then there's like chl chlorella, which actually I think is in green juice. But yeah. like I've used chlorella. Yeah. So there's like all these like antioxidant benefits to it and all these, like basically everything that um, green juice promotes, but it's like this new thing. Like it's all of a sudden we just found this algae from, uh, you know, the Himalayas or something. I don't know. I don't know where they it, they came up with it, but it's the latest thing that I heard. I don't know if you heard of it. Well, I think it's a back to his point. It's like something that we've known for a long time yeah. and then it's just being recycled. You know what it's they, just recycled. Like, yeah. You know what they like, do, bro? Listen, rebranded. Yeah. If I'll just, just talking to anybody who wants to start a supplement business. Here's something you do. Go back to find 15, a truth. Yeah, yeah, no, no, true. find something that's true and then find it in something that's obscure. So then you sound like you're introducing uh, this new. I was going to say, go back 20 years and what was popping. That was that's it, another way to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Go back know? 20 years. What like, was, I can't wait till like Vanadol Sulfate and Smilax come back into fashion. They will because yeah. they were popping in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they will come back in. Remember, yeah, I said that. Yeah, Someone's yeah. going to sell. In fact, somebody listening is like, oh shit. Yeah. Let me look that up. He's like, damn it. I'm going to work on that. I was about to release that. He's letting everybody know. I took chlorella for a while um yeah I, you know what's interesting about that what's uh what's the compound in greens that make it green what's it called doug what is it uh it's a good question it's it's up. i don't know why it's at the tip chlorophyll. Of my chlorophyll chlorophyll yeah you know chlorophyll is remarkably like similar yeah no. hemoglobin right Sorry. it's it's really uh it's remarkably similar to human blood what yeah, chlorophyll, which is in plants. Well, which it's is basically what plant blood, right? Is that what it is? Plant blood. Look up chlorophyll and human blood. I, I read about this a long time ago. I may be wrong. I may be totally wrong. I've heard this before. Well, hey, remember what I told you it's guys? It's just weird that hey, they're so remember similar. what I told you guys? One of, the, one of the neatest things about learning about marijuana plants was the similarities of like the nutrients, the peaking, <laughs> the timing of the plant. It's like taking yeah. care of people. Bro, it was literally like They're that. Living beings. I th I th now I get why, them. you know, people are like, some people with the plants are like super hokey like that. Yeah. They talk to them <laughs> yeah. and they uh, like, the, you know what I'm saying? There They're are like, plant people out there. There are, are obsessed, there are, right? Yeah. There is somebody who's listening right now There's like 100%. Oh, here I get it, it is. Uh, the green, okay, chlorophyll, the green pigment found in plant leaves is chemically similar to hemoglobin. Wow. A protein of red blood cells that carries oxygen throughout the body. So some researchers suggest no way. that chlorophyll may help with blood conditions like anemia and thalassemia because it can mimic hemoglobin's actions. That's why. Wow. So I yes, so and it says underneath chlorophyll may help produce red blood cells. Hmm. So, and so uh, they've done animal studies with anemia. <laughs> so here's a deal. If you're an endurance athlete or you want more endurance, this may be a supplement yeah. or something to look into. Hmm. Because obviously more red blood cells means more oxygen. Interesting. You know? I mean, what do, what do the uh, what do the athletes, what do the cyclists and the endurance athletes use? Oh, EPO? Yeah. EPO? I, I EPO. always thought things like uh, raisins and things like that that would, and spi well, spinach is known to do that also. Yeah. Why do yeah, you say raisins? Uh, raisins is high in, high in iron, also would increase red blood cells. Oh, the, yeah. maybe the iron? Yeah. The iron, yeah. Yeah, that's what Wait, that's, are raisins higher in iron than grapes? 
I believe same thing, they, aren't they? They, are, they are. They are because they're condi- how? Because we need to. They're condensed. You eat like ten raisins to five grapes. Oh, so higher per gram. Yeah, yeah, per gram they'll be yeah. higher. No, I, that was like the staple, like uh, have, I, shriveled grapes. Have you seen, by the way? Have you seen the marketing around uh, prunes? How it's changed? Have you seen this? No. So prunes, which are plums that are dried. Yeah. Okay. When we were kids and before. Would, when you think prunes, what do you think? Prune juice. Yeah, but what do you think? You what do you, why would you take? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> Justin. yeah, yeah. Immediately. If yeah. you're constipated. <laughs> He's like, I know this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got this one, Alex, for yeah, yeah, 500. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Constipation yeah, for yeah. 500, please. Yeah, yeah. You take shit, Alex. <laughs> yeah. So, pr- so prunes, when we were growing up and before, it's like if you were if your kid is constipated, if grandma can't poop, yeah, yeah. eat some prunes, have yeah. some prune juice. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like bad marketing for a while. So then nobody bought prunes because they were good. It was yeah. Always like if you yeah, can't everybody's poop. embarrassed. Nobody wants to admit what's, they're eating. Prunes. Hey, go yeah. to the, go yeah. to, How did they rebrand this? Yeah, go rebrand? to the grocery store. You go look them up now. Go find them. They're all called dried prunes now. No, excuse me, dried uh, plums. Nobody says prunes oh, anymore. Oh wow! It says dried plums. I'm like dried plums. Just, just trying to get bad. Yeah, I'm like, why do they call it? Why do they just call it prunes? Interesting. And it it well, dawned we have on a me. Plum tree. I'm and always I was like, what do we do with this? Like, why even have a tree? Like, there's so many of them. now. Plums are too. delicious. They're they're actually good. They're they're really juicy. That's like, one of my favorite fruits. Dude. Yeah, I mean, it was like it's comparable. Like the peaches, obviously, like everybody knows how good those are. Yeah, like, you know, you, like, you just reminded good. me something. I'm gonna put it out there for the audience, maybe because I'm always looking for cool books like this. I think stories like this are. So fascinating when somebody like a new CEO comes in or, and they're rebranding something for like yeah. that's been going for like 50 years. I mean, a good example of that would be like something like Stussy, right? Or yeah. Champion. I got a, I got a better one for you. Really? Yes, dude. Give it to me. Oh, those are, those are crazy no, mothballs. Stussy and Champion yeah. were sold in Kmart <laughs> and, still, still old Kmart and Ross and somehow made its way into I like street one. brand high end clothes for kids. I got one yeah, better for you. This yeah. is a well known one. When I bring it up, you remember. Okay. When we were kids before and before, this particular, you actually brought it up, this particular food had a bad rap. Nobody liked them. They're gross. If you give me a cookie with these, I'll throw the cookie Oh, away. I already know. The Brussels raisins. sprouts. No, uh, raisins. Oh, raisins. Raisins. Do you guys uh, remember the California yes. raisins? Yes. Do you they, know how much they're worth? Yes. They're worth hell of money. So they, they literally, the raisin, I don't yes, know. Yes, they came out. Who the hell came up with the they, California raisins? The, a guy, it, guy was came, the, it was, it was yeah, a jingle it was like, with the intent to rebrand them. To rebrand oh. them. Yeah, that was it. And was, raisins blew up. Yeah. They blew up. I mean, I mean, Popeye and spinach, you know, yeah. that, that was like a, a popular idea. It was like to kind of like make a cartoon out of whatever you're trying to sell. Back in the day, that's how they moved a lot. There's got to be a book on this. There's got to be a book that has like all the best rebrands or the comebacks. It's crazy or, yeah, somebody, how effective I, it is. Yeah, I want to, I want to, I would love to read that. I, I mean, I'm so interested in those stories. I think so, it's so So fast. my raisins, is, by the way, it's a well-known one. They look at sales of raisins yeah. and then oh. the California raisins come out. And kids wanted to eat them, and everybody Insane. started eating raisins. Yeah. yeah. Whereas before that was like the dorkiest, nerdiest, never eat them food. Boring raisins. snacks. Yeah. Um, nice. Popeye closed me as a kid. Closed me. Clo- oh, yeah. I was. I hate it. Who likes re- spinach when you're a kid? Popeye closed me, and then the all the milk campaigns closed me, dude. Yeah. Like big time. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, I'm gonna get big by just drinking gallons yeah. of milk. Yeah. So, and so did I. Now even I, I have it. all the gastrointestinal problems <laughs> as a result of that, bro. I literally because you're probably doing like two percent or skim oh, on that too, yes. right? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, it started out like that because because low fat, right? Yeah. Well, God, forbid. God forbid. Yeah. No, I used to I used to pound. I would buy a what's the what's the the skinnier was a pint. Is that a pint of uh, of milk? Not right. the gallon. Yeah, but the small yeah. Oh, it's a pint. Cool. I'd have a pint of whole milk every morning with my breakfast oh my in God. high school. Oh. Every morning I would drink that on the oh, way to school. Yeah. And almost puke. I don't know why I thought peanut butter and jellies <laughs> were the answer to bulking when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I would. That was just, popular. I would. Yeah, add, I think it was because it was easy and fast. Like it's like stack like four of them, and, and they're so, delicious. Yeah, and they're delicious. So, so good. It was bro. like I used to stuff myself after after a meal. I would eat a protein shake and a peanut butter and jelly. After yeah. meals. Yeah. What do you think? Meals. People, oh, bro. the biggest misconceptions people have in terms of like I get a lot of protein from. Like, like I think Nuts. peanut butter is one. For oh, sure. oh, definitely. I was going to say the the uh, protein sources, and then I'd say even uh, sizes. Yeah. Like you think because you eat eggs. Yeah. Oh, that's a good like source of protein. Meat. I had two yeah. eggs. Yeah. yeah or or grams. I had a turkey sandwich at Togo's. Like, and so yeah. you go like, yeah. oh, that's high protein. It's like, no, it's four ounces, bro. Or oh, it's twenty two grams in a couple eggs. I it's think like, it's all, not- the, all the plant sources. Like I had beans. Oh, beans. Yeah, they have protein, but you know how many beans you have to eat to get through yeah, a room of full of beans dude yeah. just assume like good luck yeah, yeah i mean most people that's stomach. why i mean i obviously this conversation started all on these breakfast foods but i can't stress enough how as a trainer maybe one of the first big things to if you're listening right now and you're starting your journey 
And uh, one of the biggest things I could ever do for a client, uh, obviously, is to get them strength training, right? That's that's always number one, right? Getting them moving and staying strength training it, just a couple times a week, two, three times a week. Yeah. It, and basic, not crazy, nope. not hard, not a lot, just strength training yeah, compared two lifts. It, paired with eating a high protein breakfast. Like literally, that's a, gr that's a great happens. start for like 90% of people that are just trying to figure things out right now. It's like, go eat a high protein breakfast, go lift weights two times, three times a week, four or five exercise, don't overthink it, and like watch what that does by itself. You know, you you brought up companies that, or, or you know, like themes or whatever that just made a huge turnaround with marketing. Yeah. Doug pulled up some, and one is standing out to me, Crocs. <laughs> Crocs almost went bankrupt in 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know when I go to the gym, I work out in a- like Everybody a, has Crocs. So why is popular. everybody wearing Crocs in the gym? And, so, and all, the, all my kids, like their generation, like- I remember Domino's kid. Pizza. I remember the the. I remember that story. That's a cool story. Oh, you guys yeah, remember? They the, made a massive comeback. I, used, yeah. I had a T-shirt. I had a Domino's Pizza T-shirt when I was a kid with the Noid. The, the Void, the Noid. Remember that guy? Yeah, of course. Oh, wow, Marvel that? too. He, huh? he was a little annoying uh, uh, troll or something. Yeah, find Weird. me find me a book on this. There's got to be a book with all of it. Yeah. Apple. Oh yeah, that's yeah. A good of course, one. everybody knows the Apple knows story. Apple. Yeah, yeah, the, the a, Apple story a, of Jobs leaving and coming. Oh, back. dude. Speaking of tech and stuff. Uh, so as of the recording of this, obviously we record these ahead of time. So who knows what's going to happen until this this drops? But the interview that Elon Musk did with Donald Trump. Oh, did you watch that? Listen, I didn't watch. Listen, it. okay. This is the weirdest, craziest, most insane time in my life. Yeah. Around topics like this, because well, I'll, I'll just explain what happened. Uh, and this is objective. I'm not going to give my opinion on Trump or whatever. Just the, the stuff around it, surrounding it. The European Union sent, told Elon they will fine him and prosecute him if he airs the interview with Trump. Yeah. Okay? Just if he airs it. Don't air this. If you do, we're going to fine the hell out of you. What? What, what do they care? I don't this understand. Isn't even their election. I don't know what's happening. I don't understand. Like... Why they're trying to police the internet all of a sudden? I don't know what the hell's going on over there. I know they, in the UK they're they've they're, lost their mind. They're um, arresting people for quote unquote hateful speech on social yeah, media. Yeah, like memes. It's 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 a weird time. It's, it's really weird. So it's there's tyranny, dude. Because like, be, look, be objective, everybody listening right now. There's far worse stuff on the internet than an interview with a former president. I don't and and this is before it even aired. So it's not like he said something. And they're like, hey, a, this is really terrible. Yeah. Just don't air it, is what they said. And they sent him a letter. Elon responded by tagging the president, the whoever leads the European Union with a, you know, go F yourself meme, which I think is hilarious. It's like, okay, this is going to get yeah. weird. Then he goes on to do the interview on X and they get a massive DDoS attack. Basically, this is when they saturate your data so that you can't, your, your, your site doesn't work. And really, the only people that can do that are people with a lot of power. So it's either deep state, it's a crazy organization of hackers, who knows? But they they were successful in shutting down their ability to, to run this interview for like three hours. Yeah. Then he finally got it up. And it's, I mean, it's, I don't know how many millions of views. I heard had a now. million live viewers. Live. 1.7. Like, ne like never that's ever been done. Like live. No one's watching. And it. as of right now, I think the cumulative views is like 80 million or something like that. Just crazy. What a weird time. It's very organized. This is so strange to me. Yeah. I can't believe that Europe, Western countries, right? Why, is isn't, why isn't Kamala getting suppressed? <sighs> I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah. She's so popular. That's why. Yeah, well, so popular. I just I want to ask She's people so well questions, liked. like you know, like you know, obviously people hate Donald Trump for whatever reasons that they have, but like, why isn't this happening to her? <sighs> You know, he got, did, didn't he just get uh, absolved of that court case? One of them. Recently? Yeah. yeah. One I just hope this Supreme. isn't our It doesn't future. matter. We, I hope this isn't I'm our just future. Saying, I like, hope we don't have to think about politics the level that we have to think about politics in the last, like, just decade. Like, is yeah. this, like, the future? Is it going to be like this or worse forever? I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid because of how polarizing social media can be, how fast yeah. news travels. Yeah that this is forever the formula and strategy and it's just like sh right now it's Trump and Kamala or it was Trump and Biden before and it was Trump and Hillary before it doesn't matter yeah it doesn't matter we're always going to have this going forward this crazy Look, vitriol on each side and like alarmist type of post I think like, that's I think ugh. what you're saying is 100% we need so to pay attention to I think we need to pay attention to that for sure but the part that alarms me is the attempt at censorship 
from mm-hmm. Western nations. This is yeah. really strange. That's so anti Western values. It's anti uh, free speech. Yep. It's very strange. Free speech should be almost a hundred percent free because who determines what is considered hateful or dangerous speech are the people in power. And in the past, this is a fact. Okay. In the past, if you were preaching against slavery, they would have said you're hateful because that's the law of the land. If you were preaching against giving women the, the right to vote or preaching against war in Vietnam or any of the war, they would have they would have shut you down. So we need free speech, which means you're going to get shitty speech coming out as well. But felons and criminals have been speaking freely for a long time. They wanted to shut down an interview. With the for, with the former president, and they were and, and they literally threatened somebody who owns a platform. Why are you so threatened? What is going <laughs> what, on? You know, what are you hiding? This is weird. Yeah, it's really it's, really weird. It's just it's it's accelerating, and we knew it was happening. We knew it was going to keep, you know, getting intense, more intense as we get closer to November. It's just going to keep but weird things are going to keep happening. So I I saw someone talk on this. We've had this debate before on the show. It's like, was it always like this? Is it just now that we're now it's more obvious, or mm-hmm. is it just getting worse? Somebody made it, I heard, I heard, I don't remember who it was. They made a really good point. It was, um, I can't remember his name. I can picture his face. Uh, the scientist who's been on Rogan, him and his brother, mm-hmm. uh, Weinstein. There you go. Yeah. He did this talk on it. Made a lot of sense. Eric he, says, or? Uh, he said in the past, Brett and Eric. Brett. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Eric that said this. He said in the past, um, it was easy to control the media because you had like five networks and maybe 10 networks. Mm-hmm. He said, now because it's so decentralized, they just can't control it. And so the reason why it's crazy is because it's it's almost impossible for them to completely control. So it's now it looks more obvious and more insane. Yeah, it's like pirate radio. Like, yeah. Really, like, podcasting is pirate radio. That's what it was. And they can't, like, yeah, they can't contain it. No. Yeah. So it, it questions the, the overall narrative, which – you know, they're trying to still protect by all means necessary. So they still, you know, have their hands in these big corporations and, and can kind of help at least kind of steer that messaging. Well, uh, what, and a lot of people fall for it. Now, I don't know how true this is, but what Elon said, the, now he, post, he posted the letter they sent him or whatever, the email. So that was real. This He said this. I don't know if this is true or not, but he said the European Union essentially tried to make a deal with him and said, if you censor this, uh, we'll leave you alone. If you don't, we're going to come after you. And he said the other social media platforms agreed to it, but I didn't. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So he's saying they came to him. Even even Facebook, because I feel like Zuck has been trying to like be more balanced. He about- has on yeah in his rounds. He's been doing interviews and stuff, and he's yeah. He seems like a like he's trying to be a lot more balanced. Hopefully, with his- have you been watching his stuff? No. Yeah, he's coming out and saying that like he hasn't came out and endorsed Trump, but he's definitely basically said he made a lot of mistakes in the last election, and he's oh, like, oh wow, I yeah, know that. Oh yeah, you haven't seen that? No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Seen a couple. He's not trying not to bombard people with propaganda, but I mean, it's almost impossible. Is that why he has his bunker that he built? Or <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay, like, I think he just shit. sees it right on the wall. And he's yeah. just like, dude, I'm, <laughs> yeah. He's no like, matter what I do, it's screwed. So here, I'm gonna go over here. Yeah, crazy. And, that, and those are way up, right? Bunker bunker sales. They're like up. Are like, they? Yeah, that's like they're. I think it's like at record highs of like people building them and purchasing. It them would be a, so <laughs> shitty though to live in a bunker, wouldn't it? What? Yeah, like the shit at the I fan. Mean, that's like last. I mean, is it better than living not living though? I mean. I mean, what would well, you, no, I get it. I'm yeah. just saying it would suck. Yeah, you no, imagine. I don't know, living, you just watched Furiosa. I, I mean, did, bro. We, I watched is half. This of where it. we're going. I'm or halfway what? through it. Hey, by the way, what a great, great movie. Well, they're just so glad you guys finally watched such it. Such good storytelling. It is that whole like dystopian world. Good storytelling. Good acting. Good cinematography. It was the, good. The was language good that around. they use, like they call gasoline guzzoline. Yeah, you know, or yeah, you could tell like they're trying to depict like it's a dystopian future where you know the English language got twisted and. Pretty, it's, it's not bad. Yeah. I'm halfway through, so I really liked it. And I'm that's not really, I'm you guys are more sci fi guys, but I don't, oh, Justin it, will love it. I don't yeah. think it got enough love. I was like, I don't remember anybody yeah, in here get promoted I don't, too much. Yeah, I didn't hear a lot of people talking about it, but I mean, I like it. got the, good Rotten Tomatoes score from I, the audience. Yeah, it did. And I liked it just as much as the other one that we talk about that was really good, which, yeah. uh, which the other one, Dune. Yeah, Dune. No, uh, Dune's yeah, on another level, bro. Oh, I thought it's, I thought it was right in the same category. I, I definitely know. think so. No way. Dune mm-hmm. is just the whole. What? what do, I, the things I just listed, Furioso had. Yeah, no, what they did, did a Dune good have job. Didn't have. They did a good job, but Dune is just epic storytelling on a whole another. In I my mean, opinion. I mean. In my opinion. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't know. <laughs> one thumb up, one thumb down. What do we I do? mean, no. I mean, I think. 
I mean, it, I wouldn't. Okay, it's maybe it's a, a little bit better movie, but I mean, for all the same reasons, I think Furiosa is just. I like, see the point you're making. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like it's like you could. I mean, are you like that one a yeah. little bit better because maybe you have a draw to do yeah. more the storyline or whatever? Yeah. Dude, but. I gotta say, I gotta tell you guys about what I'm reading on the trends of uh, fitness trends right now. We've been predicting this for a long time. You know, we published a book, the the Resistance Training Revolution, predicting like this is happening. I just read an article on Gen Z and their um, uh, the trends around fitness with Gen Z. You ready for this? Yeah. They're far more into strength training than any other previous generation. In fact, they're more into strength training. Far more? Far more. Huh. In fact, they're more into strength training than any other form of exercise, pretty much. Really? And you know who's driving it in Gen Z? Us. No. Yeah. <laughs> Enzo? No. No, <laughs> oh, but it, no. You know who's driving it? Shout out to Enzo. Yeah, yeah shout out. With, uh, women. Oh, wow. oh wow. The women. I mean, the girls. They, they drive every market, right? They do. I mean, they so do. I guess we should have been able to- It's uh, the girls. And they're, and I read this article on the- I don't remember what the percentage was. It was a significant percentage of growth. In fact, and then you know, gyms are, are, know this. They're changing the footprint. We talked about that. But they, they, were, they, had, they were interviewing girls and they're like, yeah, mm. we know, well, my mom was working out. They just wanted to be skinny, but we don't want to be skinny. We want to have big butts and big biceps. Big Let, biceps. Let's go, muscle mommy. I know. Let's go, muscle mommy. Crazy, right? Uh, so I think and now as Gen Z starts, to, they're driving the trend. So um, I think we're really on the cusp of a real strength training uh, revolution or fitness trend. And the reason why I like this fitness trend, unless it gets distorted and gets twisted, it's going to stick around because it's real. Like this yeah. is a trend that's going to stick around because people, if they do it right, are going to be like, oh, yeah, this is a great way to work well, out. Well, okay, this is kind of funny and somewhat related, but uh, if you think of an athlete that uh, promoted their own like fitness book, like what kind of athletes come to mind? That, that would type of athletes? Yeah, like if you had an athlete and you're going to pick – like oh like they probably have an awesome like fitness regiment and they should write a book about uh, it. Football player, football, yeah. or, football player, or like yeah. Um, anyway, anyways, what what I was surprised was there was an actual fitness book that Babe Ruth wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, guy who showed up to, to games drunk and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, on <laughs> Cigar, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like cocaine. Like who knows what this guy was doing? You know, like but apparently he had. Like he got so out of shape and he was like going through a few seasons of like some of his worst performance and hired this, this well-known fitness guy, uh, over what? there in New York. And then Who? like, I'm trying to remember the name of him, but, um, they didn't even talk about the actual name of the, the trainer in the article, which was frustrating. Damn it. Uh, but if it was, uh, Jack Elaine or no, 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 no. it wasn't, it wasn't anybody famous like that, but Babe it was, was like, before him. No. Jack yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah no, you're well right. before that. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, right, yeah you're right, you're before right. him. Yeah. But it was all like it was all like body weight training and then stuff with his bat where he and he did a lot of rotational stuff. It was all like calisthenics, but like really decent like nutrition advice and all this stuff. And like and then he got like leaner. And I didn't realize Babe Ruth got leaner and muscular, came back and started playing amazing, took them to like the World Series, you know, the next uh, few years after that. Yeah. But I was like all I remember from Babe Ruth was that he was like an overweight, just like home run freaking. Yeah. The, yeah, but imagine though you get him to lose, cow. you get him to lose fifteen twenty pounds, and now and he's one of the most famous people at the time. You, marketing, perfect marketing. Have you guys yeah. ever? Angle. So this makes totally. Me, yeah. So I have a guys, baseball thing for you. Well, so. I was going to ask you guys because okay. you guys are sports guys. How well do you? Because back then they didn't train like they do now. They didn't have any of the science yeah, technology. Yeah. And they were all working, bro. They were like, <laughs> they were full time contractors, know, yeah. and yeah. then on the on hard the side, they, were playing they didn't need to work out. How good do you think Babe Ruth? Because obviously, the reason why he was able to do what he did, which so even today, if you did what he did, you'd be no like better, one of the no, best. no much better. And I know people are gonna what? fucking yeah, no much better. Because here's the you have to understand, especially a game like baseball. Part uh, Babe Ruth was also hitting off of guys that wouldn't even make it in the minor leagues, pitching to him. Oh, yeah. Where guys now throw 103 miles an hour what and have four different pitches, sport. bro. They were yeah. not throwing pitches like that. What was the top? Put, put Doug, look up. What did he play? 30s. I believe so. Look up how Jackie fast. Robinson came how in fast was a was a <laughs> major league bro, baseball? Not in even just the fast. The, the movement and control and the precision of an, a pitcher today was not even the same universe. 
Not even the same universe. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so I mean, so it's all now, obviously, that's a he, good point. He's not trained. So it's, it's all relative. That's why everybody always tries to be like, because everybody else would have been better. If you were in that era and you watched it, you want to defend that guy always. That's how everybody yeah. is, right? But there's like, just like guys that will talk about basketball in the 80s and 90s, how much tougher, better they were. Oh, on average, in the 1920s, they were throwing 85 miles an hour. Yeah, some Sal, pitchers you know topped out at 90. 85 miles an hour is a high school pitcher. Well, hold bro. on a second. Some pitchers topped out at 90. That's pretty good. What are they doing now? What's 90? It's 90's not average. just that, though. 90 is a, a, there's a huge difference between 90, Sal, and 103 with control yeah. and, and all kinds of different pitches. Uh, they didn't have all the same pitches they were throwing did with they, today. Did they use a different size bat and everything, too? Uh, I know that the Probably. I know the size of the field was different. Um, I, I'm not sure if the base, uh, distance was different. They've changed some things like that, yeah. but all in all, the quality of the guy who you're playing against is yeah. different too. So yeah. you have to factor well, that so in. I so just like, like my point I'm making with basketball, right? Cause this is very contentious right now. Cause we all grew up in the eighties and there's a lot of people that, and I'm a big nineties basketball fan too and want to say that that dream team is better than ever but the man the level of science for these athletes today yeah. what well, lebron james is doing at his age we've never seen anything like this physically what he's capable i don't know if you guys watched any of the nba in the olympics right now that dude i mean he was mvp and he's what year 20 what is he 22 24 no, no, he years in the league and he's dominating in the olympics still like yeah. That's insane. Like yeah. to think that. And then someone wants to be like, oh yeah, well, you know, if he played back with Michael Jordan, he'd get his ass kicked. I'm like, uh, no, I don't think so. He is a specimen, like a hundred percent. And I'm a Michael Jordan fan, and I'll make that argument, he's the GOAT all day. But also understand that we've evolved so much in sports science, nutrition, recovery. So I saw like this technique. I, I like saw everything. a meme that was comparing yeah. the fastest sprinters in the nineteen thirties to today. The difference wasn't huge, although that's sprinting, right? 0.5 seconds is a big difference in sprinting or whatever. But they showed that what kind of what they were running on, the shoes that they used. They yeah. didn't use blocks. Right. They literally just put their feet on the ground and took yeah. off. And they the the speculation was that the difference in time really is up to was based off of that. Same yeah. thing with swimming records. Yeah, and now swimming and swimming and sprinting, and not to take anything away from those athletes, is very straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the, they the, the art of that football, for, the yeah. skill and the gamesmanship, totally and the different. strategy yeah. of football and basketball and these other games. There's so many other things that we've been able to evolve, and the bringing in the like you go sprint on a, a turn on a day. Okay, like your recovery to what understanding recovery then comparing to a football player who's going to show up every yeah. Sunday and slam into guys in like basketball playing every other day like that, like understanding that like I'll say this, game. though, about the older athletes. I will say that they were tougher, but it's not because of anything other than. Oh, I don't you, I don't disagree with that. I, you yeah. had to be tougher. I don't disagree with that. Just to be alive. I mean, just to, I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's because here's the thing to get defend Grit. the Babe Ruth era and stuff like that. Try going to work, you know, pounding railroad for fucking yeah. 50 hours a week and then go play a game you know what i'm saying like or or watch a boxing match where they went for 15 or 20 rounds yeah, and yeah. the ref didn't stop it yeah, yeah, ever yeah the you ref know. stopped it when your eyeball fell out of your head otherwise you just keep going <laughs> hey, they like punch each other all night until the next day <laughs> since we only get these little <laughs> moments of sports talk so i have something for you since you brought a baseball that I, I wanted to talk to you about that i thought was really interesting i just learned about do you know what the, do you know what the most expensive baseball card sell sold for just not that long ago it's Let me. Not like a do you Mickey know? Mantle do you know how much it is, and do you know who it is? You, yeah, okay, so you don't know who it is because the story behind it's actually really interesting. Is it Ty Cobb? No, no, it's not. It's not anybody who you guys are going to guess. Did I get it's, a name right? Yeah. Did I just so name look right? up the most Nobody expensive baseball guy, card. Did okay. I got it right? <laughs> okay. Look at the most expensive no, baseball card. I think it sold for twenty five million dollars wow. just recently, and in, in shitty condition. Right? Let me see it. Show it's me the in top. Shitty line. condition too. Yeah. Oh yeah. It sold. It was like a like a, a score of a five. Wow. That's that's not Mickey Mantle. Go to go go. And maybe it's not up yet. No, 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 it is. I, it, it, there it is right there. See that card on the left and the pictures of three? That little tiny one. Oh, with I the thought that, that's not Ty Cobb? No. That's, What's I'll his name? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Pull up his name. Oh, I've seen that card. Yeah, so, I've seen him. No, no, no. Wagner. Yes. So why that's famous. Hey, why don't we comb our hair like that anymore? Let me tell you why this is famous. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So Herman. he, early on, was against promoting smoking to children, and baseball cards were in packs of, of, of cigarettes. 
And the reason why that is so wow. expensive is because he refused to be to his car, his trading card to be put in cigarettes. And so, uh, but it had already gone out, and there's no only way. so many that actually made it into the cigarette Damn. boxes and people have in circulation. How and cool the best that? one that's ever been graded is a grade five, which is like bent corner. I yeah. mean, five is not a good card, okay. right? And I mean, even like one that was torn, I think sold for like twelve million or something. Oh my god! Like, yes, you know, so my, that's how rare that card is. That's yeah. the reason why that card is. And he was also a great player, by the way. He was also so they printed them, but then they never put it in circulation. It was, no, it did get into circulation circula for a short period of time, and then he was like, "I." He made a stand. I do not want my card. Oh, so then they, were, yeah, yeah, I don't want kids buying cigarettes. It. That's right. I don't want kids. How buying crazy is it back then? My grand, my great grandfather. Okay, he started smoking at the age of nine. And was chain smoking. Nine. So wow. and these were rolled cigarettes. These were not like no filter on that yeah, thing. Well, now and themselves. so this makes sense now, right? Yeah. Like it was promoted to get kids oh, started. Bro, they were working early on. They were working in factories or in the fields. <laughs> I've seen those yeah. old pictures. <laughs> it's just a like, twelve year old <laughs> just chain smoking. Ugh, times are tough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they I are mean, tough. let's be honest. We were promoting it to pregnant women at one point. Listen, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So like, listen, uh, if, what's, I was, if yeah. pregnant women can have it, why can't kids have it? Listen, <laughs> if I'm nine years old or ten years old doing hard labor, I probably need a cigarette. To be yeah, like that's not you know yeah. that's not too crazy sounding. Little, little cough syrup. Isn't that opium, cool though? You know? I thought that was I thought that was a really interesting so uh, cool so fact I the most expensive guys. stamp ever sold I think is more expensive than that. What do you think, stamp or baseball card? Oh, that's a good. That's uh, interesting. I mean, the stamp is going to be more. It has historic, more historic, but yeah, not. It's more the expensive. upside down airplane stamp. You ever seen that? Mm -mm. They misprinted a stamp with an air, like a oh, biplane upside down. upside down. Look up the most expensive stamp ever sold. I pro maybe I'm wrong. It's, it's always the mistakes. Million? Maybe it, I, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I don't know, but I know it was a lot. Yeah, you gotta look for all the hey, imperfections. This, this, this hey. segment just just highlight what a big dork you are. Listen. The fact that I brought up a cool. <laughs> dude, stamps. I brought up a yeah. cool baseball stat. You brought up collection. a stamp, dude. Hey, <laughs> You guys collect mold? <laughs> <laughs> hey. What is it? What is it? 9.4. No, the baseball one, bro. Uh, 9.4, it says? Where's According it say? to that, 9.4 uh, million. It's in 2023. Uh, stamps less cool. No, okay. Well, I that's, guess. Sorry. Yeah. You know what's funny? I mean, that's up there, though, bro. As I mean, I that's, was talking, that's up there with some of the most expensive. Hold on. As I was talking, sure. I was like, this sounds nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's it oh, right so there. The upside down. Maybe that's the most expensive U.S. stamp. Oh, okay. Two million bucks. Yeah, it's an upside, upside down, down biplane. Yeah, I did have a stamp collection for a second. I did. I don't know where it went. It's too bad. I don't know where it went. Yeah. I had one too, actually. Did, did you, you really? Yeah. You guys are a bunch did of dorks. Did you ever collect <laughs> coins? You needed better uh, yeah. coins. I had coins. coins. I have. I had real silver dollars. I've actually got silver dollars coins. somewhere. Uh, I don't know where I, they're yeah, at. I collected silver dollars and- actually, uh, uh, what's the other one? The, Two dollar bills. Half dollar. Uh, yeah. When you think about it, that's the only thing that has real value. Those silver coins because yeah. they're real. It's real. Yeah. Silver. It's real silver. Yeah. 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 Wow. Is it is it true to the weight, or is it like technically silver dollars are probably worth more than a dollar now? So oh, way more because it's real silver. It's real silver. Yeah. It's way more. Silver. Yeah. Way more than a dollar. So if you want to buy, I know this is a fact. Mm -hmm. If you, I mean, I haven't checked it for a month or two, but if you want to buy like a ninety percent, that, that's how they used to make them. They were ninety percent uh, silver, I think, ten percent nickel. If you want to get a 90% um, like silver half dollar, you'll pay like 20 times face just for that. Uh, wow. Yeah. Because so I, so I have a, I have a, uh, you know, it was one of those ones you fold out, had yeah. the years. So did I. Yeah. yeah so I don't know where mine is. I know. I don't know where mine's at my either. My mom has I got, I literally, yeah. that was my first job. My I got too. paid in silver dollars and yeah. like half dollars uh, walking this little wiener dog for this old lady. Did you Random. save them? Yeah. I saved them all of it. Yeah. So that I never even spent it. Now, do you know where yours are at? Either my parents' house. Oh, see, I don't yeah. know where mine is. Why are her parents' house? I don't know. I, I, don't know. I never. My, mom. my mom's got mine too. I don't know why. Yeah, there's all this. The, yeah, all the she, collectible things. I just left it. I never got she it. She sold it to get into Amway, so she yeah. could sell Amway. <laughs> <laughs> my mom did do that. Yeah, by I know way. she did. Yeah, my mom did. She always make jokes about yeah, like, know, the yeah, multi-level. Yeah, oh god. Anyway, hey, we supposed yeah. to mention state liberty. I got to say this about state liberty. Uh, I actually got this comment from my wife that the state liberty. So people don't know. We work with state liberty. They're a company that makes like nice looking formal clothes for men. That's tailored for people who work out, right? So oh. off the rack, you buy a shirt, you buy a suit, it fits. It fits. The waist is small, the shoulders are wide. She said they make me look buffer. Yeah. So guess it what shirt I'm wearing your every muscles. day? Yeah. Every day. I'm I'll so glad wearing. we have something to refer like buff dudes to because yeah. like I get some messages like even from their wife will be like, oh, I'm looking for some like out like some you know clothes that'll actually fit, and yeah. I'm like, dude, this. You gotta look into state limits. They're also a because there's a lot of brands in the in the gym 
world that have popped up that like you know fitness guys have done but it's like a, this is not like this thing literally looks good like you wear the suit you look yeah like you're no 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 James it's high Bond. it's high end yeah. like so that's what i like about it is it's not just some it's you know, also a gym bro who who bought some china uh, clothes like nice, and threw his logo yeah. on it i want to say this too a few tailors <laughs> for, for people to listening business and like yeah. it's yeah. a compliment too if you want to get someone a, a gift from a clothing place and also subtly compliment them that they're buffed yeah <laughs> that's it yeah. right because if you got if you got somebody like a big and tall gift card you know it's kind of like am i fat if you get somebody like a state and liberty oh i'm jack so Thank i you. have to go a size up and everything are you in the state and liberty yeah. yes uh uh i'm on the cusp oh I'm you on are the cusp. are you now even though you're 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 oh that's a good question yeah I think so. Still? I still think so. Yeah, wow. it's because it's my dimensions. It's like mm -hmm. more. Yeah. It's more my my how tall, how wide my shoulders are. Even You're though my arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. Uh, I'm got it. The waist awful. issue, but for me, it's always the neck. Like because like in your head. Well, because I wear ties in yeah. my big ass head. <laughs> <laughs> he stretches the head out. <laughs> hey, I can't even get the shirt this over. Melon. <laughs> this big melon. He gets shirts like you know how little babies wear those. Oh, they have those shirts that you can fold so you can uh, take them, pull them down if they uh -huh. poop them. Himself. Yeah. That's for Justin. Hey, he's that friend you get hella pissed when he puts your sunglasses on. You're like, get my fucking sunglasses off, bro. Oh, yeah, they're like this. Oh, yeah. 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 They fall off my ears. I'm afterwards. trying to catch up. Lately, yeah. my head's been growing. You guys, you guys show me old pictures of myself. Yeah. So, yeah, I got, I got a few more years. To I saw that. Yeah. I saw the one that you Andy and she posted up in the in the forum for the uh, the GLP one. I was like, damn, this Saudis eat a sandwich. <laughs> that's like, an old picture. Hell, yeah. I had hella gut issues yeah, too, man. That was a, that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I never had skinny neck. <laughs> yeah, skinny neck. No, it was always good. You did look like I a skinny neck. That's, that's why I say you, 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 you got buffed your neck now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. all right, whatever. Yeah. That's that's you gotta get me back for the big head jokes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. Anyway, all right, do we have a shout? Touche. Do we have a shout out today? I'm gonna keep shouting out for a little while till we really start to see everybody go over there. Is the Mind Pump Trainers Instagram every day? Um, we're dropping reels and content, uh, uh, tremendous value. So like, uh, this, uh, obviously it is so nice to, it's a page for trainers and coaches. Yeah. Go check it out. And the fact that we have, uh, the manpower to put out as much valuable content as, as, as this, like we didn't have that when we first started, we had Doug and then the three of us. And so it was a lot harder to put out as much valuable content it took us longer. And so this thing has not even been up for, I don't know what, two months. And the amount of content uh, on here that's super valuable is incredible. So Mind Pump Trainers on Instagram. One of the most challenging things with eating on the go or snacking is most snacks are full of carbs. You don't get a lot of protein. They're just not good for you. Well, there's a company called Paleo Valley that made a meat stick. It's grass-fed. It's got great macros, high in protein. It's not dry. tastes delicious. It's got a long shelf life, so you could take it with you anywhere. It is my favorite on-the-go, gut-health-friendly, high-protein snack. Go check them out. Go to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump. On that link, they'll give you a hookup. All right, back to the show. First question is from Catherine89. Can you please give me more details on why our body needs rest days and time to recover and adapt? I've heard it over and over and still have this drive that makes me want to work hard every day. It's hard for me to slow down and really give my body a rest and I'm fatigued. On a practical level, what can I tell myself and how can I convince myself that it's safe to take a rest day and I won't lose progress? Okay, so number one, Catherine, I'm going to give you the, 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 like the facts around recovery. I don't think that's going to help you, though. Um, I think what you're dealing with is you're, you're using exercise uh, almost like a drug. Uh, it's a bit of an abusive relationship where you don't want to stop either because of um, maybe some insecurities around your, your body, but more likely you're probably running from something. And so sitting still is very challenging. So that being said, here's the deal around rest and recovery and adaptation. The reason why exercise gets you stronger, improves your endurance, your strength, your stamina, the reason why it builds muscle, the reason why it can uh, help burn body fat and all that stuff is because exercise is a stress. So when you work out, you're stressing your body. You're actually causing some damage to your body. What your body does is it heals from that damage, okay, because that's good. You want to heal from damage. And then what it does is it tries to bolster itself or adapt to that stress so that next time the same insult, the same kind of stress doesn't cause the same amount of damage. That's it uh, in, in a nutshell. In other words, you go to the gym, you do, or whatever, you're in your bedroom, you do 10 push-ups that are very difficult. 
You cause some local damage to the chest, shoulders, and triceps. You get a little sore, stress on the body. The body heals from it and goes, okay, if this happens again, we don't want this damage to happen again. Let's get a little stronger so that, you know, 10 push-ups doesn't cause that damage. So without rest and recovery, you don't progress, period, end of story. Now, you won't lose progress because you're losing progress now. If you're yeah. overdoing it, yeah. you're damaging your body before your body can adapt. So you might even allow yourself to recover, but you're not allowing the adaptation process, which is beyond recovery. So what you're doing is you're digging a hole in the ground. Your body's filling that hole. And before you can add more dirt on top of that hole, you dig it again. So you just end up do bouncing back and forth in the same place where you, you cause damage, heal, damage, heal, damage, heal, but you never really improve. So the truth is your progress is subpar now because you refuse or haven't done this. Now, again, back to my first point, I can logic this all the, all day long, but there's something else underneath this that's mm -hmm. driving you to go beat yourself up all the time because workouts yeah. hurt. They're stressful. That's they're difficult. The they're tiring. That's right. So yeah. you got to ask yourself, well, why am I, why do I want to hurt? <clears throat> why do I want to stress myself more over resting? Well, because something in the rest is more challenging for you than in the pain yeah, from the workout. Because if you're not at all feeling stronger or like feeling like you're uh, adding more energy throughout your day, you're feeling more active and more prone to to movement out of the fact that, you know, it's it's like charging you up, like your workouts are, are, are you know, bringing that kind of energy back to you, uh, then, you know, what, what are you really doing other than punishing yourself? So at the end of the day, so I, I think you just have to kind of do some soul searching and see like what, what it is you're trying to get out of it uh, and what, what that really looks like for you and what it is like maybe what Sal's alluding to. It's like, what, what are we, what are we running from and using this as, as sort of a coping mechanism for it? The other thing that this could be, because this is common too, is the clients that get stuck in the calorie burn uh, mentality which is like they want to train every day because they look at it a workout as this calorie burn right. and they ate certain amount of calories a day and this workout keeps them from getting fat, keeps them from putting any weight on. And so they're they're stuck on this hamster wheel of, well, I don't understand why I can't do that because this helps keep me in shape. And it's like, well, maybe it helps mitigate the amount of body fat that you put on because you're, you're burning like crazy. And if you had the additional three or 400 calories a day, you go out and you run again and you do your orange theory or whatever class you like to do. And that burns those calories again. And so you're not putting on any body fat, but your body's not progressing. You're constantly just tearing, breaking down, tearing, breaking down. And that's stuck in what Sal always calls a recovery trap. And you're not allowing it to recover, adapt, get stronger and improve. You're just stuck in that loop. And, you know, some people get stuck here a really long time because they're in a somewhat fit place, right? They've they got to a place where they're relatively happy where their body weight is and they're and they fit in their clothes like they want to. And they have their routine of their class or their their, their thing that they follow and they do it every single day. And it's like, I like it. But then they always are like this. But I, I, I want to progress. I want to see my abs or I want to be stronger. I want they want more. I want to build my butt. They want more from the programming, but they can't get out of this cycle of burn, 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 burn every single day. And they're not allowing the body to build. And if you want to sculpt the physique, you want to build an ass, you want to have blocky abs, you want to have shapely shoulders, you want to have a faster metabolism, you got to build. And you're not building. You're just breaking down, breaking me, down, burning, breaking down, burning. Let me add to that. So I'll make a statement just to kind of uh, make it really, really clear. An overstressed body is pro-fat anti-muscle, okay? If, this, if your level of stress, which includes exercise, it includes lack of sleep, you know, daily stress, you know, bad eating, whatever. If the level of stress that your your body is under is above what it can tolerate, your body wants to lose muscle and it wants to store body fat. Muscle is expensive tissue. In a high stress environment, your body doesn't want to burn a lot of calories. It wants to slow your metabolism down. Body fat is insurance. It's insurance, it's stored calories. Uh, so your body is going to change its hormones, and it does this very effectively, to promote fat storage, to promote muscle loss, and your cravings, your behaviors actually change to strengthen this as well. In fact, the type of body fat that you tend to gain in an overstressed environment is visceral body fat. It's the most 
uh, unhealthy type of body fat. So what Adam's saying is true, but also to take a step further, you're not making yourself, you're, you're actually going to make it harder for yourself to get leaner, harder for yourself to look and feel the way you want because you're applying too much stress. It's pro-fat, anti-muscle. So in case I didn't scare you enough, hopefully Sal did. <laughs> <laughs> Triple that. Next question is from Fulvio Castle. What's the importance of time under tension in the context of building strength and size uh, versus builders. size? Yeah, you know, you know, uh, I think T -U -T. there's truth here, but there also there's truth outside of this. So some people are like, this is real black and white. So generally speaking, within the context of what would be considered a normal rep, because you can go way too far. If a rep, if the rep takes longer, again, in the in the confines of uh, what would be considered uh, realistic or a normal set, a longer rep, a, lo a slower negative and a hold and squeeze and will... Re will result in more strength and more muscle gain, primarily muscle gain and size. So controlled reps tends to be better for building muscle. All right, here's the little asterisk here. This doesn't mean fast reps or explosive reps don't build muscle. In fact, yeah. oftentimes they build a lot of muscle. They all um, do. Now, the other, the other, what I said at first is generally true because most people can't do a fast rep with good technique and form, can't do a fast rep properly because it's high skill. So we generally communicate time under tension, control the rep, and that's going to result in, in better results. I, I like, this is an example of, and maybe I think we did an episode like this. Didn't we do an episode that was titled, um, or somewhere on the title of like, uh, um, bro science that works or yeah. like, oh, yeah. but, <laughs> didn't we do something like that? I'm pretty sure this was under there too, because this is an example to me of like good bro science. Like stuff that like, okay, the, the way the, the bodybuilding community uh, promoted this or explained yeah. it was maybe not the most scientific or the best, but the advice is really good because generally speaking, it's going to make a huge difference for a lot of people. I, I make this argument all the time. If you've listened to the show very long, I always talk about one of my favorite tips to give to anybody who's been lifting for an extended period of time and you hire me, like a quick, easy way for me to show that person gain, it gains is focusing on time and retention, yeah. slowing their tempo down. Very few people even follow the basic hypertrophy protocol, which is a four, two, two, right? A four second negative. Like next time you go in the gym, look around at everybody doing bench press and exercises and see if you can count four seconds on their negative. Almost nobody you'll see does no. that. And so it's a great way to, to, to send this signal to build muscle because there is lots of value. Plus it slows down the exercise so they have to lighten the weight and now they focus on form and technique. We know that's the, the biggest yeah, and plus. we know the huge benefits of really being connected to the right muscles that you're trying to work and what that does for gains. Yeah. And so there's an example of some bro science that works really well, which is why it's stuck around for so long. And so many people are like, I don't care what those science guys say. The, I, my buddy or my bodybuilder friend, this is he swears by this and it works. Well, yeah, it does for those reasons. The reasons why, because not enough people slow down the tempo in, in there. They don't focus on form and technique. They don't get the max benefits from the eccentric portion of the exercise. And so now you really reap those benefits. I think we've just communicated it uh, not the right way. Yeah. And so I love this advice. I love most of my clients to learn to slow down the tempo and to take the reap the benefits of time. But to Sal's point, if you've been doing that, let's say you're a guy who does six second and you've been, yeah. oh man, you took it to the extreme, heard it on mind pump. This is great. So now you're slowing down your tempo. You're getting all these gains at some point. You 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 hit the you hit that curve right you hit that bell curve you go oh you got all these benefits 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 and now it's starting to peak and now it's coming down the other way now explosive training you know yeah. one 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 is now going to send you back up that bell curve I mean again. it's just the plot point on uh, like a spectrum of acute variables like to to manipulate uh, muscle 
uh, stimulus and growth. And, you know, this is, this is a valuable way to, um, you know, adjust your, your, your training is to, to modify the tempo. Uh, you know, the extreme of that is like isometrics. And, and yeah. so I'm going to really just lean all the way into, you know, that muscle tension and, and I'm going to squeeze the max output I can in this direction. And, you know, the other end of that would be the Olympic lift where we're just like completely trying to rip, uh, you know, the barbell up and, and get into the position as quickly as possible and they all hold value. And so it's, you have to kind of like assess where you are in that spectrum, what you haven't <clears throat> investigated in a while uh, and, and move and weave your way through that in your programming. So it's super valuable. Yeah. Bottom line is um, most people have a challenge moving a weight with control and perfect form. So most people you, you shouldn't move a weight fast. Like if you can't move it with good technique and control slow, yeah. definitely there's, there's don't try prerequisites to move fast. to fast. That's right. And, you know, a shameless plug here. I mean, this is what we do in all maps programs. Yep. Is to uh, to Justin's point, right? Like, what a great way to look at it. Like, here's this. There's this spectrum of isometrics on one far side over here, and then explosive Olympic type lifting or training all the, all the way here, and then everything in the middle has lots of benefit to it. And so, and the way to do it is to phase it, like we do in all of our maps programs, for a period of time. You might be doing isometrics for another period of time. You might be doing something more explosive yeah. and fast and to move in and out of that and all those programs. So you reap the max benefits of all these different ways of training. Hey, real quick. Here's the August special. We got two programs on sale, 50% off maps bands, half off and maps 40 plus. That's also 50% off. If you want either one, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code August 50 for that discount. Back to the show. Next question is from Lolo on the gram. My range of motion and form gets compromised as I lift heavier. Is it better to go lighter and get a deeper range of motion and more control or stay heavier with a more limited range of motion? In almost every yes, case, the first one, the first one is, yes. and I say almost every because mm -hmm. there are rare exceptions where it's better to limit the range of motion. And that is very, very narrow, narrowly applied to sports specific style training. Oh, okay. I was like, where are you going with this? Yeah. Cause like, like, like if you see like a, a like, like a LeBron James squad. Yeah. yeah like that's you an see a, an NBA Quarter player, squad. like there's at that level, there's such high level. They've got great function all the way up and down. They're good everywhere. Now you're trying to build the the yeah. part of the squat that really applies to him playing basketball because he's not going to go all the way to the bottom. It's and mainly jump a hip hinge. That's at, right. At most. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, it's so 99.999 percent of people uh, watching this right now it's always lighter, greater range of motion, more control. Never, almost never, is it better to go heavier and limit your range of motion. You'll get worse results, worse technique higher rate of uh, potential injury. You're not going to build as much muscle. You're not going to feel as good. It's just, there's really no benefit to doing that, again, except for the super, super rare high-level athlete who's specifically training for something extremely specific with the coach. It's it's important that for this person to understand, too, that because I get why you would tend to do that. I remember why I tended to go that direction also is that you, you're you you're chasing more muscle. I want to be stronger. I want to build more muscle. I've heard that many times. If, if I get stronger, I'm going to build more muscle. But you're also stronger if you were, let's say you have a bench press and you shorten range of motion, you know, and with not the best form, like you're saying, you can get 225 up. But then if you go deep, full range of motion, you can only get one, 170 up or something. But if you take 170 and you practice it through full range of motion with good form and technique and you get 170 to 185, that 185 is better than that 225 at a short range of motion. You'll build more muscle with the, that gain. Uh, let me add to so that. So it's important to understand that. Yeah, let me add to that. Yeah. Let's say you went, uh, I'll use your exact, exact example, 225 <laughs> except you stop halfway on the bench press and you add 10 pounds to that. So now you can do 235. Now compare that to 170 all the way down, but then I add 10 pounds to that and I go 180 all the way down. You've got more strength gains with the 170 to 180. Even though both added 10 pounds, well, the 170 to 180 added 10 pounds through a whole range of motion. I'm also going to add that you created your a whole new dysfunction that, for yourself. Well, that's a whole nother level. If, yeah, yeah. If you're if you keep adding weight to just to that one limited range, now think about just barely, like even like a half an inch out of range, what that's going to do to you with added load. Like yeah. that's that's injury. That happened to me. That's, I mean, it's like it's, that, that's like building a race car. And we're we're piling on more horsepower while not simultaneously building the suspension and the rear end to support that horsepower. Yep. You taking it through full range of motion is you 
adequately adding horsepower while also reinforcing the the car. You just shortening the range up so you could lift a heavier bench press adds horsepower potentially to the car, but doesn't reinforce everything else. No. So it's setting you up for potential. No, damage but let, there. I'm going to paint this picture though. Okay, think of your a full range of motion being this and a half a range of motion being this. If I add 10 pounds to this much a range of motion versus 10 pounds to the full range of motion, you I've got actually more. gotten stronger yeah. in, in a larger range of motion. I've actually gotten stronger, more strong than I did with the shortened range of motion, even though they both added 10 pounds. So your gains are bigger and better, even though in both scenarios, I only added 10 pounds. And, and to your point, Justin, this was me when I was a kid. When I was a kid, up until I'd say my first or second year of personal training, because my first certification actually strengthened uh, this uh, this terrible belief. I remember my first certification taught us to bench press halfway down, mm -hmm. uh, and I know why they did that. But uh, as a kid, I didn't go all the way down because I could bench more weight, and I was like trying to chase this heavy bench press. And then as a personal trainer for the first year, I did it. Then I remember figuring out like, oh no, larger range of motion. The difference between my normal bench press and the full range of motion bench press was so stark, it was almost embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I remember I had to drop, it wasn't like, 10, 15 pounds lighter. It was like 50 pounds lighter yeah. just by going down another five inches because the disparity between full range of motion and what I was training had gotten so big. I remember how crazy it was. Like, oh my God, I got to drop 50 yeah. pounds off the, the bar. Next question is from Jamie Yoska. How many warm up sets do you suggest as you progress through the workout and get to the third and fourth exercise? Do you need as many warm up sets? Uh, the, the second part of this question is no, but really the first part, how many warm up sets do we suggest? As many, as many th th as are necessary. And now, what does that mean? When you feel good, when you feel good through the range of motion, when you feel good through the exercise, you don't notice any hitches or pain, it feels smooth. It feels connected. You don't feel shaky. You don't feel unstable. Then you're ready to go. Now, now, you why do a am good I saying job priming? You don't have to do this. No. And now, why why am right? I saying that? Okay. Why am I saying um, as many as are necessary? The more advanced you become, the less you tend to need lots of warm up sets. Um, that generally speaking, not always, because obviously, as you get really strong, sometimes you need more warm up sets just to work up to super heavy weights. But I don't need to warm up as much as a beginner does for most exercises because I can do one set of that exercise with less load and I know what to connect to, I know what to tense, I know what to look for, and that's usually enough. And then I'm ready to get into my workout. Whereas a beginner, yeah. oftentimes I have to do more general it takes priming. A repeated practice. Yeah, because they just we got to get their body to move right and they don't even know how to warm up. They don't even know what to feel. So that can take, you know, two or three sets, sometimes take 10, 15 minutes. I mean, it's, yeah, so much of this matters too, like how much, uh, where you're at uh, in your lifting career, uh, what sort of deviation or dysfunction that you have in your movement patterns. This is what Prime was all about, right? Was teaching you how to assess your, your specific movement and areas to put you into more optimal position before you get into any lifts to figure out what those exercises are and then to basically do that before every workout. Mm -hmm. And then you should be able to get into any of these lifts and get right into it. Now to Sal's point, uh, which is a great point is, you know, if you've never done a bench press, I mean, I, I guess I could prime you all day long and you just have, if you just have no feeling of what it feels like to move at the bar correctly. I mean, yeah, then you still might need some warm up sets to do that. And then that goes back to the, the, advice we've been given forever on this podcast, which is that like treat working out as practice. Um, you know, you should be less worried about, uh, quote unquote, warm up sets and then lifting heavier and more just practicing the movement. And then in that case, at whatever time would allot you, I mean, there's nothing wrong with you're following, let's say a match program or a program that calls for three or four sets of a bench press, but because you're not on a time constraint, you practice three or four sets really, really light right, right before that. So you're working on the technique of it. Like, there, man, there's nothing wrong with that. So if you if you got the time to spend practicing a movement with really light weight before you go into the lifting heavier portion in your early years of lifting, that's really only going to benefit you. Know, you know, what a good point. I think when you're, especially when you're a beginner, when you're in that first year of consistent training, your warm up is part of your workout. Now, as you get more advanced, your warm up is your warm up. It's setting you up for your workout. But when you're a beginner, when I used to train clients 
in that first, especially six months, but probably the first year of training, our warm up was their workout as well. It was yes. like, I'm trying to get you to move right. We're doing these correctional movements. We're doing this priming. Mm -hmm. Well, when do I get to the workout? Well, this is part of the workout. This is literally part of the workout. This is training your body to move right. If we don't do this, the workout isn't complete. And the reason why I'm saying that is I think sometimes people look at warm ups like a waste of time. I just right. want to get to the workout. That's yeah. not what gets me results. Right. No, no, that gets you results. That that warm up gets you results as well in that first kind of beginning stage of of your of your training career. Later on than it is, it's just to get you to the workout. But yeah, in the beginning, I, it's not. I think to referring back to what we brought up earlier in this episode where we're talking about tempo and uh and that's why, you know, in the beginning phase, like that's that's why that's, you know, preferable because we're we're able to control the weight. We're, we're probably not like adding as high a load uh, initially. Uh, it's about form. It's about technique, and so you, you're really like paying attention to the intention there of of everything going on, uh, which is essentially closely related to a warm up set. It's just that you're working through all these uh, variables and factors, and you're getting better at them, and then you're adding load to that as you go. So it's it's not necessarily like I'm trying to uh, do really light load and then all of a sudden just stack all the weight on at mm -hmm. once and like I need to get there really quick. Uh, it's about being proficient and, and disciplined and working your way up that totally. to progressive and load. You gotta, and, and also like know yourself, <laughs> like uh, I have to warm up or prime significantly more for a squat than I do for a deadlift. For me, a deadlift, I, I could almost jump into my heavy sets. It takes me two sets. For yeah. a squat, it's like 20 minutes. Yeah. Of warming usually up, usually ankles or, or shoulders yeah. or big ones. Everybody's different, yeah. you know. I know people that jump right into overhead press. I know that people it takes twenty minutes to get them ready to overhead press properly. So it's going to be different from movement to movement. It's crazy that we 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 look at this so different. But if you were to explain this in like like a sport, it's so obvious, right? Like it's like asking the question, like you know, you know, I'm I'm working out, or you're playing a sport. It's like, do I need to keep doing practice, or can I just play the games on Saturday? Like how many practice? <laughs> how many practices do I need to do during the week to, uh, or should I just play the games on Saturday? I yeah. just want to get to the games. It's like, well, I mean, you're just learning the sport right now, so like, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, practice becomes more important than the game. Yeah. Playing the game yes. at full speed and with other players, like, yeah, okay, there, there's some value to that. I'm not saying there's not. But practice becomes everything. Like you learning the fundamentals, the technique, the form, getting good at that is going to give you so much gains and lay Completely. such a solid foundation for you becoming a great player, a great athlete, or a person who gets reaps lots of benefits from the gym. So, I mean, in these early years, spend a lot of that time not overthinking the weight and working sets and think more about, I want to get great at this movement. Yeah. Control that all the little nuances. And if that takes me five warm-up sets with hardly any weight on it to only get one or two heavy working sets, who gives a shit? Because to Sal, you're in early the early years, you're still reaping a ton of benefits from figuring mm -hmm. that out. You want to get to a place where you can walk under a barbell cold and squat or bench press and get right into the form of technique. And if you're not even there yet, then practice more as much as you can. All right, I know you like that episode. If you did, check this one out. 